The topic I thought we could talk about tonight is um, understanding desire. Um, so desire is often made out to be the bad guy in spirituality, something that we have to tamp down, you know, keep under control, try to do away with. And um, so I thought it'd be useful to really explore that to see, you know, what the basis for that and if that's really completely true or not, or, you know, are we trying to do something that runs against our nature for some advertised spiritual benefit? So what I take um, desire to be is just wanting something other than whatever it is that's happening now, wanting something to be different. Um, and I, I think this is, a, you know, can be, the basis of it, I think, is a natural movement. It has some mm, evolutionary reason for being, um, you know, wanting, wanting the best for this body, wanting, to, you know, a sense of well-being, you know, a sense of health, a sense of um, comfort. You know, those kinds of things are not are not wrong, right? There's um, you know, wanting, um, desiring to take care of this body, you know, by feeding it well, by treating it well, by getting enough sleep, by, you know, drinking enough water on a hot day if you're outside. Um, those kinds of things, that desire to quench the thirst or the desire to eat or the desire to sleep, all of those things are just fine, right? Per perfectly normal part of living in these bodies. And there's also that, you know, desire could be, you know, more on a, on a um, you know, level of species and, you know, the desire for, you know, furtherance of the species, procreation, you know, taking care of our neighbor, taking care of the planet that feeds us, you know, those kind of um, desires born of, you um, you know, a, a just genuine sense of um, being respectful to to this life. Um, it's obviously not a problem, right? So it's not those kind of desires that are problematic. So um, what kind are? Well, I mean, the most obvious one is when we are abusive to the, the body by, um, you know, just seeking seeking temporary pleasures right um, you know there's lots of examples but you know let's just say that um, things that we all that did when we were younger certainly don't do it anymore but um, you know going out for pizza and beer late at night and sort of eating you know having this desire for something that's greasy and salty and you know just is just this, you know, sort of gelatinous mass that um, can eat and um, has all kinds of flavors, and but it's sort of filled with, um, you know, cheese that comes from milk from cows that are been fed growth hormones and fed genetically modified grains that have been sprayed with glyphosate, and so it's not actually good for you, but there's that desire in that moment for that that sensation. Okay, so obvious example, um, the suffering will come soon enough, you know, the middle of the night or the next morning. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of things that we, um, you know, do is in seeking, you know, to sort of give this body some pleasure, even if it's a momentary pleasure. Some of them some of these ways of doing this are obviously a lot more dysfunctional than other ways, you know, um, you know, getting a cup of tea and, you know, it sort of soothes the body and there's, there's no problem there. Right. Um, but the, it, it's sort of worth looking at the underlying movement more so than the actual 
substance that that's being consumed, like why, you know, what's what's motivating that um, that desire? So it can be quite simple, or or it can be a much deeper thing. Okay, so um, those are sort of obvious examples on the level of just sort of pleasuring this body, you know, things that um, aren't aren't that functional, um, but we do them anyway, right? Okay, so that's obvious enough. So let's look at, um, you know, two other kinds of desires that perhaps aren't quite as obvious. Um, and they are um, wanting something or wanting to get rid of something. You know, both, both are desires, right? Wanting to change our experience. Why? <laughs> to feel better, right? Have a better experience. So uh, these are ways to uh, change our uh, our state, our state of mind, our feeling by um, using our energy in some particular way to to get something or to get rid of something. So two different ways. So um, Nisargadatta had an interesting take on desire. He said, "It's desire itself isn't the problem. The problem is what we desire. You know, we, you know, if we desire something that's just, um, you know, will satisfy us for a moment or a short time, or hoping that we'll change our mood or." how we feel about ourselves, um, that's sort of squandering that energy of desire. So rather than trying to tamp down desire, actually use that energy, uh, but use it in um, the most constructive way possible, right? Go big, <laughs> you know, use that energy of desire, of longing to um, really look at the nature of existence, you know, who's living this life, our deepest nature, those kinds of questions. So rather than tamping down the desire to actually use that energy fully, um, not try to oppose it, not try to diminish it, not try to um, make it go away, because again, that opposition does, just doesn't work, but actually use that energy. So in some ways, that's an, almost an investment right? How do we invest the time and energy that we have in this lifetime? You know, in, in what are we investing? You know, so, um, you know, we can, it's just something that we can look at. So if we're, um, if we're trying to gain something, grasping, right? I, I want something, and the only reason to want something is that is out of a belief that it's not already present. Right? Um, if it was already present, you wouldn't want it. So it's any kind of desire or grasping is either wanting it or wanting to hold on to something that's already already happening that's pleasurable. You know, I want this relationship to remain forever, just like it is, never change. You know, grasping trying to control, trying to control what the future, you know, how I'll feel at some later date. So let's just as an example, let's say, um, um, let's say we, you know, have this desire to buy a house, a big house, bigger than we can really afford. And, um, you know, we can we can do it for a lot of reasons. A lot of a lot of them aren't necessarily reasons that we even are that clear about. But you know, let's just say that um, you know we get into something. We have a mortgage to pay. You know, we have some anxiety about whether we'll keep our job to pay the mortgage, and you know, so that there's some. You know, it's it's not all fun and games. There's some some cost to having that. Um, that which we imagine will give us certain pleasures, right? So it might be the pleasure just to 
comfort, you know, physical comfort. I need that. I want that. Um, you know, it might be, you know, more subtle, a sense of, you know, pride of ownership, you know, that, you know, my friends will think more highly of me. I'll be respected for being able to afford such a nice house, whatever. Of course, we don't actually say that out loud. You know, we'll talk about, you know, people ask us why we bought that house. We can talk about the tile floors or the walk-in closets or something. But um, usually it's the those underlying sort of psychological needs that we think will be fulfilled by something that we that we gain, you know, that we that comes into our control. Um, it's interesting. About a um, hundred years ago, the um, advertising uh, industry changed. Before that, it was basically, you know, like the old Sears and Robux catalogs, which would basically give you facts about the product. Um, and then someone realized that, no, what actually sells the product is how you will feel when you own it, right? the kind of self-esteem that it'll give you. Uh, it'll, you know, if you drive this brand of car, you know, how people will see you. And so the whole, the whole industry changed. So uh, it appealed to this sense of how we will feel sometime in the future, of course, how we will feel by gaining something that what we desire. So it's not so much the object, it's more how we'll feel when we have that object in hand. Right? So it's not so much the house itself, it's how we'll feel when we're in the house. That's 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 sort of the deeper, deeper motivation. And that's fine, you know, to have a house and be comfortable, no no problems, right? Um, but the question is, you know, what's that underlying need that we believe will be satisfied by owning the house? Because if we if we think that what's actually making us feel um, you know and improves our self esteem and makes us you know increases our sense of well being if we believe that it that originates in the house, then as long as we own the house, we'd be happy we'd be unavoidably happy we'd be continuously happy as long as we had the house if the source of happiness was in the house, we'd be happy right. But that's not how it works out. You know, we may still enjoy the house, but sooner or later, there will be a sense of wanting something more. Bigger house. You know, house on the beach. Another house. There'll be some movement. A car to park in the driveway of our house. <laughs> New kitchen for our house. Always, you know, there'll be something more. There'll be a sense of not quite enough. This is nice, perhaps, but not quite enough. So there's this movement towards more. And so we can hopefully see that the the source of that contentment doesn't lie in the object itself. It lies in how we feel about it. Right, so this movement of desiring something, there, there's sort of a, it's, it's, it's not really painful, but there's a sense of, you know, wanting something. It's, it's not quite fulfilled and we, you know, depending on our level of desperation about how much we want it, it can be, you know, sort of mildly discomforting or can be painful if we you know desperately want something. And then let's say we get get what we want, then we feel happy, right? And we usually assume that we're happy because we get what we want. But I'd suggest that we're actually happy because that sense of wanting has been satisfied for a short time. Not forever but for a short time. 
and then the one thing will come back again. But if we expect that the happiness is to be gained from the object of desire, um, sooner or later we will always be left wanting. Either we get what we want, well, let's say, first of all, we don't get what we want, and then we suffer, right? Because we really wanted it, it didn't work out, and um, we feel disappointed. Or we do get what we want, but it's never ultimately satisfying, and um, you know, we, sooner or later we find ourselves needing something else, and then we suffer. So whether we get it and we suffer, or we don't get it and we suffer, either way, there's the same cycle of wanting, getting or not getting, and then eventual dissolution. It doesn't have to be sort of abject desolation or that kind of suffering. It can be just you know, disappointment. It can be anxiety about whether you know, that situation will, will last, that relationship will last. I can afford the mortgage or not. That kind of suffering. So this grasping after this sort of hope that somehow it'll be fulfilled somehow in the future. You know, there's almost this sense of you know, this drug of hopium, you know, trying to grasp after uh, something that will continue to satisfy this, this need. And I think this, the need that's ultimately trying to be satisfied is some um, sort of a deep inner contentment that we once knew and we may not remember consciously but I think there can be a sense of, um, I know it's possible, more like that. More like that than I remember a specific state and that's what I want. It's more like this vague, vague longing of, of um, for peace and contentment and a sense of wanting to feel at home, at home in these bodies, at home in the world. You know, so that that's the sense that's trying to be fulfilled, and we we look to do it by grasping something that's not now present. The issue is that whatever we actually are is must be always present. It can't if if it's essential to what we are, it can't be absent and come and go. It must be here already, right? So if what we're grasping after is something other than what's happening in this moment, um, we can be sure that it's coming from the mind, not from our essential being. Something the mind came up with. The mind thinking, I need this to feel complete. That sense. We can be sure that if that movement is coming from a place that's not not our essential nature. So does this mean that um, you know you know if we really tap into what we essentially are, that there'll be no movement to do anything? That we just become couch potatoes? No, of course not. It's, it's the mind thinking. Well, that would be the outcome. But it, it's not like that. Because the when we really allow things to be as they are in this moment, then there's a potential without wanting something to be different other than it is in this moment. Um, then, then the sort of full potential of this moment becomes more available. 
if we're always sort of have our attention parked in the future somewhere like that, that's when I'll really be happy when that happens. You know, even to make a statement like that implies, does it not, that, well, I'm not all that happy right now. So as many times as we've all heard, heard that life only happens in the present moment, um, we still don't really believe it. <laughs> we still think, yeah, that, that, that sort of may be true. But what's really important is how I'll feel tomorrow or next week or next year. That's what I have to plan for. But the reality is when we are wholeheartedly present for this moment, fully participating in this moment, somehow the, the future works out. It does happen. And it actually flows much more easily because um, we're sort of more in alignment with life as it's unfolding in this moment, not opposed to it, you know, a participant in it, not objecting to the way it's showing up in this moment. Okay, so this is this is the movement towards more. You know, I want to I want to grasp something. I want to bring something into my experience that's not now present to improve what improve my sense of well-being. Right? But to do that is a denial of what can be discovered as being already present. Okay, so that's that's um, one sort of category of desire, desiring for more. Then there's another category that's not usually considered as a desire, but it's a desire to get rid of what I don't want, right? You know, desire for it not to be a rainy day, desire not to have a busy mind, um, desire that the other person stops annoying me. Um, Whatever. And what we what we generally look for is a quick fix to the problem, right? You know, maybe um, I don't know. We're feeling a little bored. Solution: eat or drink. Feeling a little lonely? We watch a, a romantic comedy. You know, we're feeling low self-esteem. You know, we change our appearance. You know, we're undergoing a midlife crisis and we have an affair. <laughs> you, know, you know, we have a busy mind and we think, okay, the solution, just stop thinking, right? The direct approach. Or, you know, if someone annoys us, it's the easiest thing, just blame the other person, you know. So it's just this sense of, quick fix. You know, I have a headache, I'll take a pill. You know, I won't actually look at what the underlying cause there is. I'll just try to make it go away. So this is how we usually treat um, these kind of things, whether it's a situation or whether it is a um, personal habit or um, mental state that we happen to be in. Um, you know, we just, we just want it to stop. We want it to dismissed you know we're not really willing to take a look at it most of the time to see what is maybe a, a deeper source of whatever it is that's happening so there's um there's two possibilities here one is we try to deal with it on the level of level of form you could say you know, fix it, make it go away as quickly as possible. The other possibility is to investigate um, what is present for it, what's noticing it, what's what's that about? You know, and what most people do is focus on the situation or the habit or the the annoying person. That's the focus to try to resolve it at that level. You know, sort of, it's not, not anything to do with me. It's, it's, I'm being, you know, my mood is being caused by, you know, the actions of this other person. Right? I'm, I'm just the helpless victim here. 
But we could do the same thing with, you know, if it's a habit or a mental um, pattern, like maybe being judgmental or being angry. Um, you know, we can just say, well, I, that's just my condition. What can I do? You know, it's just who I am. You know, it's been around my whole life. What can I do? So we can try to um, make excuses for it or resolve it on that level, you know, just trying to fix the situation, you know, so that the external environment makes me comfortable. So there was a um, man, he's, he's uh, since died, um, pretty famous in his time as a movie star and sort of, uh, you know, romantic, um, you know, leading actor and wealthy corporate person, Howard Hughes, immensely wealthy, immensely wealthy. And in his old age, um, he was, he became so afraid of germs that he lived as a recluse in a dark apartment, not seeing anybody. And even afraid to touch anything unless he was using a piece of tissue paper to pick it up. That was his life. Wealthy could do anything he wanted, and that's what his life was reduced to um, because he was trying to deal with it on the level of forms. It was the germs that were the problem, right? It wasn't his perspective, it was the germs that were the problem. You know, and so if we try to resolve things on the level, um, you know, you know, contain the annoying person, blame them, change the situation, um, you know, wh however we are dealing with um, what it is that is causing us discomfort, um, medicate away our, you know, our depressed states, whatever, you know, then we're just still dealing with it as the problem is there. It's not how I'm feeling it. Okay. So as long as we're subjecting ourselves to whatever um, environment we find ourselves in and, and presume that the resolution is out there, we suffer because that that will always be changing sometimes for the better sometimes not um, always unpredictable always changing even when it's all in order it doesn't tend to stay that way maybe for a while but not ultimately and there's always anxiety that it um, even when everything's going well, there's the underlying anxiety about when's the other shoe going to drop. Even when all is going well, if we're trying to resolve it on the level of form. Right? So that's, that's one possibility. I mean, the other possibility is to actually actually look, as we've talked about many times, look at what is actually, um, where's this all happening within, right within this awareness that we talked about. Our entire life is unfolding within that. That awareness is already unconditioned. It's not like we have to fix our conditioning. That's, that's a lifelong project, never ending, because we'll always find something more to be dissatisfied with, whether it's inside ourselves or outside of ourselves. If that's where we're trying to make everything suit us, right? or we can see that the awareness that's actually living this life is, is okay with it. Sure, the body prefers this over that, but it, the awareness is actually already okay with it. All of it, it is. 
so we can we have the choice of trying to do this fruitless project of trying to get life to conform to what we want or we can really check into what is actually living this life and seeing if there's a problem there at all. You know, sure, well, there'll still be things that we'll have to resolve, and but we don't take it as being a life in opposition to us. Now, Jesus didn't say, you know, I'll, I'll be exceptionally peaceful when everything goes my way. He didn't, he didn't say that. He, he talked about the peace that surpasses all understanding, right? The peace that's possible regardless of circumstances. Peace that's possible regardless of what is happening. That's really the true freedom, because then, then we're not dependent on the actions of the other people. We're not, we're not at the mercy of our conditioning. You know, we can view that conditioning from a place that is unconditioned, a place that's willing objectively to look at the conditioning that we have and just see it, just see it exactly as it is not be extra harsh, not be judgmental, not blame it on anybody or parents or whoever, society. We just see it is what it is. And just and really sense into it the, the movement of it, you know, what triggers it, and sort of the flavor of it, what we tell ourselves about it. What we think the outcome is, what's its relationship to suffering, that we can do, really, really investigate it rather than just try to make it go away. So when we can really see that life actually isn't the enemy, it's not like we have to put everything in life in order, in order to feel okay. We can just see that life is doing everything that it possibly can to try to get us to see what's actually true. It really, it really is. We may not like it all the time, you know, life, life is a way of being quite persistent in that regard. Especially once you express some sincerity about um, spirituality, true spirituality. You know, it's 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 good if you get into spirituality not to go halfway. You go halfway, you've sort of seen too much to turn back, and you haven't resolved anything yet, and it's just painful. And the only way out is forward. Forward means, you know, letting go, being open, being willing to look, being willing to consider you know, that one's opinions and ideas and judgments and certainties may not be all that true. But that, that is the path forward. So this, this movement it's, um, of desire, is, it's important to recognize that desire is energy. It's energy that we can use wisely, or it's energy that we can use foolishly. Um, and if we're using it just to pacify this organism in whatever way that we choose that's not really not really functional to what we really want, um, then, then we're wasting the opportunity. 
but that same desire as energy um, has the capacity to really um, investigate what this life is about. And that's, that's an opportunity that we have um, in this lifetime to look for ourselves, to find out what's actually, actually true, what's actually living this life. And that discovery is freedom. Freedom not to do any foolish thing that we want, but freedom to actually fully participate in life. Wholeheartedly. In, in the present moment as it unfolds, um, you know, without concern about outcome or fear of what may or may not happen in the future, just out of the joy of, of the present moment, how that unfolds, um, you know, movement out of, um, you know, enjoying or enjoying this, you know, amazing opportunity to be a, alive in this body. <laughs> 